Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Paysetter exclusive event for the Boston Marathon Jimmy Fun Walk presented by Hyundai. Um, this is our, our typically our summer uh, Paysetter event. We're at Fenway Park and we're enjoying um, hot dog, Fenway Franks and popcorn and sodas and things of that nature. And obviously things are a little different this year. So I really do appreciate um, you tuning in with us tonight for a very, very exciting cooking uh, demonstration. And I just want to give a quick, a uh, couple of quick updates before we get to the good stuff. I want to thank our friends at SBLI and our friends at Stop and Shop who are uh, very graciously sponsoring tonight's event. Um, congratulations to each of you for being pace setters already for the Jimmy Fun Walk Your Way. Uh, we have our first 200 pace setters with us tonight. Uh, you know, it goes without saying that today's, that today, that this year has been uh, really like no other. It's been extremely tough. I know um, for those of you that have joined us on some of our town halls, you'll see the similar backdrop. I am uh, in the same location that we've been in every time that we've chatted. And I know many of you are in the same situation. And we just really cannot thank you enough um, for all the work that you do. Uh, you know, the Jimmy Fall community is, is made up of a group of strong and diverse supporters who have been there for us, for our doctors, for our nurses, our researchers, um, patients and families at Dana-Farber. And your role in this, in the past, today, and into the future is, is very, very important into what we want to do as an organization. Um, I truly believe that we are, are striving to great things within this organization, within the walk itself. And we are, you know, we really are stronger together. And you as pace setters really set the example for, for many others. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping updates. As mentioned in the town halls in the past, if there's been, if there's any quick, uh, you know, technical issues that we run into, just bear with us for 30 seconds or so while we get it fixed. Um, also, if you have a question, I'd ask that you use the Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen. We will do all we can to answer all the questions um, in the allotted time that we have, but all of you are on mute and your cameras are disabled. Um, the cooking demonstration is being recorded. will be shared in an email tomorrow so that um, you can continue to perfect your skills over time um, as, we, as we look forward to such a great night tonight. So I know many of you are looking forward to, to getting started with our uh, featured guest, celebrity chef, Chris Nerschel. Um, before we do that, I just want to give a couple of quick updates on the walk itself, and then we will turn it over to Chef Chris. Um, as you've likely heard by now, we have our new Charity Miles app for the Jimmy Fun Walk, and all summer long, we're continuing to push content out through the app. We've had some information on our heroes. We did our um, fundraising challenge last week. Uh, so there's continuously going to be things coming out through that. Continue to check in on that. The app will allow you to track your exercise to not only help you, you know, with your training, but you can share it on social media, help drum up additional support. Um, and, you know, as, as pay setters, you already know the value of, of fundraising and, and you've more than likely um, dipped your toe into the app a little bit to, to kind of uh, become familiar with it. I just encourage you to continue uh, to use it and hopefully you're finding it very successful. Um, a quick reminder on our fundraising recognition program. Um, as many of you know, for the past several years, we've had this program that allows you to qualify for uh, Jimmy Fund swag, uh, if you will, based on your final fundraising amount. Um, it's been a really, really successful program for us over the years. Um, our per walker average in the, in the time that we've had this program has increased nearly 25% per walker since we started this. It's a really great program. Um, it's completely voluntary. Uh, if you can, don't want to take advantage of it and, and, and redeem any of the items, you certainly do not have to. Um, but we found that, it, that it's been a really successful motivator to have people continue in their fundraising. And I think as, as pace setters, you've already set such a great example to go out and do more than the minimum and more than maybe you set your, set your goals for initially. Um, and I think it just shows you that, you know, that we, we want to try to reward those folks that continue to go above and beyond even more so. And, and again, you all are, are, you know, resounding examples of, of what you can do. Um, lastly, my quick update is on our Jimmy Fun Walk t-shirts. Um, all of you are going to be receiving your t-shirt in the mail along with your bib, your medal, and some other um, walk day item, swag, those kind of things. You can expect to receive that um, approximately a week before Jimmy Fun Walk. Um, the Jimmy Fun Walk t-shirts are given to the first 5,000 walkers that register. Um, of course, you're all a part of that, but 
anybody that registers, as long as it's in the first 5,000 prior to September 7th, will receive this in the mail. Um, and of course, as pay setters, you get your pay setter bib, special uh, blue, different than the, the normal bibs that we give out. So um, continue to work hard. You're doing an amazing job. We cannot thank you enough. Um, and just really, really appreciative. And again, my th big thanks to SBLI and Stop and Shop. Um, you know, there are many, many uh, worthy causes at this time that, that organizations and sponsors can uh, decide to support and for you to stick with the Jimmy Fund and with the Jimmy Fund Walk. Um, we are extremely proud of the, of the relationship that we have with both organizations and certainly encourage all of you to, uh, to support those sponsors that are so supportive of the Jimmy Fund. Um, having said that, now on to our celebrity guest. I'm very, very excited to introduce our host for tonight, celebrity chef Chris Nerschel. Chef Chris is the CEO of New York Catering Service. He's cooked in many acclaimed restaurants, competed on many television shows, television uh, culinary competitions, and even cooked for many celebrities. Um, Sh Chef Chris is going to be preparing a chicken piccata for, my, for us tonight, and he is tuning in uh, from a nice, a beautiful kitchen in the Hamptons. So we're very, very excited. Chris is here to be uh, our, our celebrity uh, chef, our guest for the night. Many of you, I hope you were able to take advantage of the gift cards that were mailed to you to buy all the ingredients for tonight. Um, if for some reason you haven't gotten the gift card yet, please let us know. Um, and again, feel free to cook along with Chef Chris or simply sit back, enjoy the demonstration, and this will be recorded and sent out tomorrow. So again, you can perfect those skills. Um, I am now, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Chef Chris. Chef, thank you so much for joining us tonight and we're looking forward to the demo. Thank you. Hello, how is everybody? Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me well? Yes? yes okay, sir. I'm gonna take that as a yes. Fabulous, so today we're doing chicken piccata. Um, obviously I have my swag, so make sure you get your swag. Um, I also have a hat, but that's upstairs. Um, Italian food's one of my favorite cuisines. I went to a French cooking school um, about 12 years ago. I was sort of at an in-between place. Went to the French Culinary Institute, but I turned it into Italian, American, French, sort of cuisine and the art of food. I'm um, very happy to be here as part of the Jimmy Fund. Uh, means a lot to me. I also grew up in Brooklyn, Massachusetts, so definitely very close to the heart. Um, some of my background with food competitions and such is I was on Food Network Star Season 7, then Chopped All Star Season 2, then on Dr. Oz, CNN, NBC, I've hosted a few shows, and right now I'm actually here in the Hamptons in New York, and I am cooking for, probably not supposed to say it, but the CEO of Airbnb, one of my clients, he's a great, great, uh, great guy, and I made sure to make time in my day to do this demo, and then I'm right back out the door, back to the store, and cooking again. So right now I'm gonna go over some knife techniques. Your left hand is gonna be doing most of the work. A lot of people are like, how can chefs cook, I mean, how can chefs cut so fast? So, I call this a bear claw. So, those of you at home that are sort of working on your knife skills, do it a little slower. You can even do it like this. My left hand is doing all the work, and then, Uh, not one cut. Definitely don't try that at home if you're not sufficient with a knife. Um, so my chicken piccata, I sort of, I don't want to make it like the traditional boring chicken piccata. So I know you have the recipe. I'm using that recipe, but I'm just making it a little more fun. That's what us chefs do. So here out in the Hamptons, we have a lot of farms. Um, so I thought, let's get some nice, uh, you know, some nice tomatoes for the Jimmy Spawn, all types of gorgeousness. Um, a few other techniques that I'm going to be doing after this little knife skills tutorial is I'm going to be butterflying chicken, then I'm going to pound my chicken out, I'm going to dredge my chicken with flour, uh, dredging just to let you know is when you put flour on one side and sort of let it just come right off. You're not deep frying it, you are dredging it. That is typical for a standard chicken piccata. Uh, the first few restaurants I ran were actually in Little Italy, and I actually got to learn from an eight-year-old grandmother. She was pretty crazy, but it was a fabulous experience. Um, and I got to learn all types of really cool recipes. Um, so everything also should be nice and, you know, I like to play with colors and play with flavors. Um, and one important thing when you're dealing with chicken, make sure 
not to be using the same uh, cutting board or make sure to thoroughly wash it as you know, chicken can present some dangers. And we always want to be safe when in the kitchen, not just during COVID, but always. So right now, I want to also thank my producer, Adam. Adam, you're doing a great job filming. All right, cool. So here we have our other board for chicken. I'm going to call this the chicken board for now. We are going to butterfly some chicken. So here's our chicken. I actually did something that is not in the recipe. I did a buttermilk brine, which I just let it soak in buttermilk overnight. Uh, with some salt and some seasoning that loosens it up. A lot of times uh, it'll tenderize it very quickly. Um, in terms of knives, everyone's like, oh, what's the sharpest knife? Well, I prefer to use my Japanese knives or, you know, German steel is always good, like a Wusta. Make sure your knives are sharp. I don't advise doing this with two knives, but I can't find my honing steel. Uh, that thing that you go like this, yes, it's called a honing steel. So, do we have any questions at this point? No? Adam, questions? Any Not, questions? No, you don't have to no. ask that. Okay, you're doing good Okay, so, water flying chicken. You want your chicken to be secure. You want your hand to be on top of it. You do not want your fingers flopping off the chicken because you're gonna cut your hand. So I'm gonna do it this way to show you, but I recommend at home doing it right off the table, safely like this. And so you all can see it because I've done this 500 times. You're gonna put your hand on it securely, sharp knife, straight through, bada bing, and it almost fell, bada boom. So that's my chicken. I'm actually gonna make six pieces. So I'm also gonna, same thing, very consistent. As you can see right here, my thickness is the exact same. And it looks like a, a heart. So obviously it's about the Jimmy fun, lots of love. All right. Now, our last piece of chicken. I'm making six portions. You guys are probably making two or four or maybe 10 at home, who knows? So same thing, just like that. So now that we have our chicken and it has been butterflied, I know I did it very, very fast. Um, definitely take your time. Definitely do not use a serrated knife. A serrated knife might give you a really bad cut and that will not be fun. At this point, you wanna have out your flour, this is my flour, AP flour. I added a little bit of salt. You wanna have your chicken butterfly. You wanna have chicken stock on the stove. So what I did was, this is my stove here. Let's switch the energy right here. Okay, my chicken is gonna be searing right here with olive oil, okay? I have that ready to go. Right here I have chicken stock, which I'm gonna be using shortly. I have a little bit of butter which I'm gonna finish my sauce with. I have capers and I have lemon. So I have chicken piccata and then a little bit of extra deliciousness. Okay, now we are gonna get our seasoning on. Make sure to season both sides of the chicken. So I got literally a board that is just big enough. I didn't even know it was gonna be big enough actually, uh, for the chicken. So I'm just gonna go salt and pepper. Nothing crazy. Salt and pepper, salt and pepper. I don't really like a ton of pepper because I don't like it too spicy. Today I'm going to use sea salt. Feel free, you can use sea salt, you can use kosher salt, you can use whatever salt you want. And that is not my pounding of the chicken. I am going to season both sides first. I also don't have a meat pounder, so I'm going to show you how to pound the chicken with your hands. All right. So I'm just putting the salt, getting it all on there. And we're going to pepper the second side of our chicken. Actually, you know what? I have a thing that looks sort of like a hammer. So I'm gonna use that, because it looks fun. So I don't even know what this is. We're renting this house, so whatever it is, I mean, it looks like Thor's hammer. I sort of feel like Thor right now. Pretty cool. Um, <laughs> all right, so our chicken's fully seasoned on both sides. And we're gonna put that aside so I have enough space to pound my chicken. When you're pounding your chicken, you wanna pound both sides, you don't have to go crazy, you know, uh, there's no need for that. What you're trying to do is tenderize it. So you probably are not using a Thor-like hammer. You're probably using a meat tenderizer that has little pointy things at the end. That is what I would prefer as well. Count it out a little bit on both sides, and then keep it right there. I'm gonna continue going just like this. Both sides. 
and I'm just going to stack them up on each other. And the best part is, is I have everything ready. So at home, whenever you're working with chicken or whenever you're making a full dish for the family, the most important thing is to have your mise en place. Yes, it is called mise en place. I don't know how to spell it, but I know that it means good stuff like celery, carrots, onions, garlic, or everything you need to cook with. Mise en place. The most important thing is organization, just like anything else. Um, and again, I want to thank Jimmy Fun. Thanks, guys, for having me here. I hopefully will be with you again. Um, and if there's any questions, we'll probably have a little, we have a Q&A after this, as well as you can always email the Jimmy Fund, and they can always, you know, reach out to me with any questions regarding the recipe or instructions or anything, really. And also feel free with the questions. You, I'm going to open the book. You guys can ask whatever you like. Chef, we actually do have a question. Um, you talked a little bit about knives, but we had a question asking, what is the best knife set for a beginner cook? Um, a beginner cook? I think Wustoff knives are great. Like, you know the ones where they have that logo? Like, Wustoff or, like, Henkel knives are, are good for, like, they're good knives. They're not even, I wouldn't say, like, beginner, beginner, but sort of beginner in the sense where, uh, where they'll where they'll keep their edge, they'll stay sharp enough. You don't want a dull knife because when you have a dull knife, you have a better chance of cutting yourself. Everyone thinks that oh my gosh, the knife's so sharp, and yes, that is intimidating. But once you get control of it, and you can always go slowly, you have less of a chance of cutting yourself. Hope that was helpful. So I'm just putting a few onions on there. Just ahead of time because I don't want any raw onions in my food. Um, so next, I'm going to flour one side of each piece of chicken. So pause me for one second. Adam, you don't have to fall over. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. I'm going to do this on a big pan only because it's a little easier. I am going to just flour one side. And then I just hold it up, let the flour come off, and I put it right down. That is dredging, dredging it with flour, where I'm not putting too much flour, and I'm also letting as much come off as possible. And I'm going to cook all these pieces of chicken in probably two pans. So I'm going to get one more pan super hot in a minute, and we'll definitely have time for another question while I'm doing that. All right. So I also have my capers. If you're not a huge caper fan, no problem. Uh, Chicken franchise is one of my favorites as well. Um, it's sort of like a chicken piccata, but with an egg batter. So you would actually flour both sides, and then you would dip it in eggs. The thing I like about Italian food is that it's sort of the basis of a lot of food in terms of cooking techniques, um, and it's extremely quick. So, you know, during this demo, I didn't do any prep. I've actually been cooking since 8 in the morning, and I did three parties yesterday. So I just came home. I was, actually, I went to the farmer's market, that's a lie. Um, and then I just sort of, as you see it here, is as I have it. Just like you at your home can do this as well. So right now I'm just gonna get one more pan going right here on my right. So I have two pans going. I'm using olive oil. It doesn't have to be the best olive oil in the world. You can use blended oil if you'd like, no big deal. Um, and we're about to get rocking. So let me just cut up one more onion because we have it. And make sure to wash your hands too. Wash your hands after you touch the chicken. I wash my hands like 30 times when I'm cooking. Good to see. And you can, the best is when you can, I can just look at you, know, you guys and say, hey, thank you for supporting the chicken fun and not cut my finger. Again, don't try that at home. Um, but it's super fun. You know, when you go with a knife, it's good to you. Um, but again, start off slow. I'm just putting these on your belt. I don't want them to burn the pan when my chicken's cooking. Thank you, Ada. No problem, wait a second. We're about to get rocking on the stove in a minute. All right, dude. You ready, Adam? You ready to rock it? All right, cool. Chicken piccata, stove side. So we're gonna have our heat on medium heat. All right, medium heat, stock in the middle. 
We have our butter very close to us. Uh, we have our capers. And we have, we have some sea salt. And just keep the camera there because it's probably making people dizzy. No, no, right here. This one right here. This here. Oh. Okay, cool. No, you're doing good. All right. Now, now that I have everything, mise and pasta out. Yes, it's that lovely French word that I learned in school 5,000 times. Um, I have everything extremely organized. And I'm not frying this chicken at all. I'm sauteing it. So you just want enough olive oil, olive oil to coat the bottom of the pan. See, it's coating the pan. And that's it. Okay? Now. We are gonna begin the process once the pan's hot. Don't put your finger in the oil. That is a terrible thing I just did. I just can't feel my fingers. So um, right now what we're gonna do is, you see once the pan starts to smoke a little bit, I like my pan to be very hot. I am going to, I'm going to, you hear that noise? That means my pan is hot enough. All right, sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. If there was no sizzle, you are not ready. Okay, so we are gonna get our four pieces going right now, and I'm gonna finish off by doing two more. And we're gonna sizzle away. Let's go back over here. Thank you. All right, so one thing that people make mistakes with a lot is rushing what they're doing when it comes to cooking. Don't rush. Have, I know if when you're at a high heat, you wanna keep flipping that steak, or can you try to keep the, keep the phone? Yes, you're good. Um, you know, they keep flipping the meat and touching it and this and that. With my chicken piccata, I can see from here, which is like four or five feet away, I'm in no rush, having a conversation with you. You want to cook it until that side is nice and brown. Your chicken will be about 70% cooked. So I'm gonna let it go. I would do the same thing if I was making uh, sole piccata or skate or fluke. You want to cook it, get a nice sear on it, a very nice sear. And now we'll go back to the stove area. So can you, can you get in here a little bit? Um, here, let me just hear it, let me get it, sorry. All right, let's hear it. I'm gonna straight grab it, also don't do this. Okay, so right now we're not adding as much color as we'd like, but we're looking good. We have a nice searing going on. We're getting a little right in our chicken. And same with over here. As you can see, that white area, that means it's cooking, and it's about 30% cooked. I'm gonna continue cooking that. Here, we hold this, please? Um, and keep the camera right here for one minute, please. I'm gonna add a little bit of lemon. In about two minutes, I'm gonna flip this because I can see, sorry Adam, I'm gonna get right up in here. Let's get right in there again. I can see now that there is a nice little brown crust coming right to the bottom of my chicken. And I just want a little bit of color. I want some contrast. So you cannot be, don't be scared of the heat. Stay away from it. Use tongs, be safe. But you gotta get in there and you gotta make sure that it's nice. Look at that. So that has some nice color on it. I'm gonna give it a little flip. Chef, we have another question that came in. Yes, yes, I'm with you. We have a few people who are wondering, thinking ahead to when they get to eat this, what type of wine best pairs with this dish? Great question. Um, so as you, you see that, now we're getting in there right now, and I'm not ignoring your question. Um, you can use a lot of different wines. I mean, a lot of people are big, like preferential people where all they want is red wine. I would say that with chicken piccata, there's a level of acidity uh, in there that you can use. I mean, really anything from a fruity Pinot Grigio and a Chard. Pinot Noir is like the cross, cross dresser of wine. Goes with almost everything. Um, I wouldn't do, I, what I would not do is a very rich uh, cab. There's no need to waste a rich cab on this. So it's pretty flexible in terms of wine. Pretty flexible in terms of wine. All right, right now I'm gonna add some liquid. 
What is the liquid you're so, using? Here, go back there. Okay, so what I used today, I actually just made a really quick veggie stock, to be honest with you, um, because I think it's fun too. Today's one of those days that I've been running around. I got 95% of my ingredients, but I forgot the chicken stock. So I said, oh my gosh, um, I had carrots, I had celery, I had onions. Put it all together, put it in water, added some salt, and I know that this is gonna have enough flavor because I've added those tomatoes, those onions, everything else that's going with it. And last but not least, we're gonna put our capers in here right now. And the capers have you know, a ton of flavor, as well as obviously we know they're a little salty. So be careful with your caper. Don't get too caper crazy. And in terms of butter, that's what I'm gonna add for butter. You do not need a ton of butter. It doesn't have to be a super fatty dish. Everybody thinks Italian food's so rich and you know, oh, it's so bad for you. No, but pasta is so good tasting and so is pizza. And <laughs> hey, how are you? So right now, as you can see, my sauce is, Okay, it is, there we go. I am gonna reduce it a little bit. So right now I know my chicken technically is like probably almost cooked, but I want my sauce to be about halfway up the chicken because a lot of the times I'll also make a pasta dish and then I'll coat it in the sauce. So as you can see, it's like three, it's, it's now not on top of the chicken, but it is reducing really nicely. I already have everything in there so that it's a pan sauce. And that's the great thing too about Italian is that a lot of the sauces are pan sauces. The flour that we put in on that one side of the chicken is actually gonna end up thickening our sauce. Um, so as you can see, it's looking pretty gorgeous. Uh, I might consolidate both of these pans just so I can keep rocking out with you guys and not make a mess. Um, so I'm gonna do a little one-two combo, put all my pieces in there. Chef, speaking of pizza and pasta, do you have a favorite yeah. meal to prepare yourself or what's your favorite food? Um, you know, my favorite is using like whatever's in season, whatever I'm feeling. I'm, that's a pretty hard question for me um, because I, I literally do enjoy what I do, which is awesome. Um, but I can cook most anything. So this guy's reducing. So I guess I didn't really properly answer your question. Uh, the answer would be, I love to eat pizza. That would be on the top of my list. I love to make homemade pasta. And other than that, I like to be inspired by what's in season. And what? What degrees one side of the chicken? What degrees? Oh, that's a good question. Somebody asked. What degree? Well, when you're cooking, you want it to be hot. It's not really a degree. What, what, when chicken's cooked, it should be 165 degrees. That's the rule of thumb with all chicken. So that's one variable that doesn't change. What temperature to cook it on, you want your pan to be hot enough where it's considered sauteing. And right here, this is my favorite thing about this dish. Is that you can prep it basically ahead of time where I have tonight's dinner and I'm actually gonna go cook dinner. I won't even be here for it, but it's prepped for everybody and it's looking gorgeous. I'm gonna put two more pieces and while we've been on this Zoom, thanks to the Jimmy Fun, I put together six pieces of chicken piccata, and I don't even know, 20 minutes or so. This right here is starting to sear. We hear it sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. And same thing that I did last time, no change at all. I saved a little bit of, I saved a little bit of my tomatoes, a little bit of my onions. I'm gonna put those right in here because I don't wanna have any waste. That's that's one big thing as a chef is that I love to experiment and now with what's going on in the world, it's very important that we don't waste unless we have to and feel free to come up with creative culinary innovation. When I'm talking to you, I'm me, not Mr. Um, it's fun to do creative culinary innovation, sort of using whatever's in your pantry. So a lot of times I'll be like, what am I gonna cook? And I just have no idea. And I'll just play a game called Pantry Raiders, where you go in your fridge, you go in your pantry, and you put something together and it ends up being delicious. And then all of a sudden it's a recipe. I mean, at least that's how it works with me. I, you know, maybe because I'm a chef, I have one leg up on it. Um, 
but you at home can do the exact same thing. So right here, I'm actually gonna use a little bit of my stock that I had with the first one. This is a little more of a, of a remember, there and then there. This is a little more of a rust version piccata because I have two more pieces. I'm pretty hungry. I want to eat. So what I did was I added my butter before turning it. And then I'm going to flip it. It's going to have color. It's going to be cooked the same way. And I'm going to add my capers and such. But I'm going to cook it about 85% on one time. This is how I would do it if I was doing a 200 person party. And if I had to keep cooking and searing and searing and searing and searing. You know, it's very repetitious. Um, you know, once you do it once or twice, you know, pan roasting, pan searing is the same, whether it's veggies, whether it's chicken piccata, you know, it really doesn't matter what it is because you're doing the same technique. You know, it's all about techniques. Uh, that's the reason I chose to go to a French cooking school is really about the techniques. French food for me is like very rich. I do love it, um, but I can't eat it every day. Otherwise I'd be like 400 pounds. Uh, so I really just enjoy the techniques I've learned with the school I went to. So this one, in order to get a little more color, I'm sort of doing a reverse plan, but I do have a plan. And right now it's looking, it looks all right. You know, it's reducing well, not as gorgeous as the crust here, right here. Not as gorgeous as the crust on these guys. So what I'm gonna do to help that is I turn my broiler on, I'm gonna pop it right in the broiler, and I'm not gonna forget about it, otherwise I'll burn it. So let's come back over here, Alan. No, right there, boom, boom. Chef, okay. we have another question come in. Yeah, I have an answer. It's awesome. Awesome. Um, when we are searing the chicken, we were wondering why do you only dredge one side of the chicken with the flour? That's a very good question. Um, give me one second. I'm washing my chicken board. Okay, great question. Um, there's not really – so the reason is when you're butterflying the chicken, uh, you know, the chicken ends up being like a half an inch thick. If I put flour on both sides, you'll taste the flour, number one. Uh, number two, both sides won't be brown. So you'll have like this like, uh, you know, texture that in my opinion is not as, uh, not really what I like. It wouldn't really be wrong if you were doing a chicken piccata and using like a pretty thick piece of chicken, feel free, flour on both sides. It makes complete sense. Um, but for this size chicken, a half inch thick, one side is the way anybody would do it in an Italian restaurant. So I sort of just stick to the basics, you know? This is a way that I learned it from an Italian grandma. You know, it's pretty simple for me because there's the right, there's the way that it's done in a restaurant and the way that it's done. And then at home, you can have fun and you can change it up a bit. So this is not particularly part of our demo, but it is because I'm showing something. I'm showing knife skills. Um, so this is a melon. Does everybody know how to know when a melon is right? You smell. So you smell it. You should smell the melon through the peel. And everyone with watermelons, with other types of melons, you know, people are scared to buy a full watermelon. Even when it's $4.99, they'll just get the little, the little quarter, the little half for a dollar a pound. You just gotta work your knife, you gotta take your time, make sure your knife is sharp, and just adapt to the shape of whatever you're cutting. So with this guy right here, which is actually gonna be my dessert, I'm just gonna do a little whip with some cantaloupe, and I, it's sort of like, a, and then you can always make a crumble. Um, that's the thing I like about food, is whatever ingredients I have in the house, I can turn them into something great while, teaching techniques of how to do certain techniques. Any questions at the moment? No? Okay, cool. So I'll keep doing this. I have my piccata in the broiler um, that I did not forget about. Uh, the rest of the piccata, I'm gonna also flash not in my, so the broiler, as everybody should know, is the top of your oven. So the broiler is the top of your oven, meaning that the heat is coming from the top portion that it's gonna give you the deepest sear possible. It will burn stuff. Make sure when your broiler's on, normally your door is supposed to be open. I mean, the door to the oven. And don't burn it because it will burn. Um, so I get, yes? We did have a question about any tips on how to manage timing so that everything is plated hot. Is that um, why you're using the broiler? 
Yeah, well, yes, because I did that, those two pieces of chicken after the first four. So I didn't want to waste any more time because I want everything to come out at the same time. So the best part about chicken piccata, chicken francese, a lot of these dishes is you can make the chicken piccata and as long as you leave it in the liquid, it can sit with foil over it or you can cool it and then heat it right back up in an organized manner because we know vegetables, if they sit out, they get soggy, uh, overcooked. I mean, if you cook them for too long, they're done. The chicken, I could put my oven on warm right now and leave it there for three hours and it would probably still be really moist and just as tender. Um, so it's all about it, timing is, I would say, just go with each, each product you're cooking. Like for steak, for instance, I would, if I was having 10 people over, I would probably sear my steak. I would get it rare. This is the way any restaurant tour would do it. And then from there, what I would do is I'd finish my steak in the oven. But by that time, I would already have a nice sear on it and it would be effortless to just do the asparagus or seasonal vegetables or whatever I like. <laughs> Farm fresh cantaloupe is real good. It's not as sweet, but just as delicious. Speaking of sweet, do you happen to have a favorite dessert that you like to bake? Do you bake? Or if not, oh. what is your favorite dessert? Um, okay, so baking is a sore subject only because I'm not the best at baking. Chill. I'm not the best at baking. Um, but because I went to a French school, I can make a souffle, I can make a chocolate cake. I like more savory desserts. So I sort of like today I'm doing a cool dessert because not only is it hot outside, but for me it's summertime, it screams cold. But a lot of my clients do love chocolate cake. I like to make ice cream. I would say ice cream is one thing I like to make. I like to make frozen yogurt. I like to make popsicles. I like to make macaroons. Other than that, I don't like to do it because it's you really got to follow the recipe book when it comes to baking because you will ruin the food. With this, it's a little more artistic, a little more creative ability. That is what I'm about. Um, but much respect to pastry chefs and anybody baking at home because I'm not the best at it. And that's actually why I got uh, kicked off Food Network, not kicked off, but taken off Food Network Star. It was my seventh episode on the show and I failed at baking. So I'm proud to admit it. It's all good. I'm not the best baby. Nice and looking good. So the piccata is probably about five minutes away. Um, and everything's looking fabulous. Very fabulous. It'll be nice and tender. And questions. Questions, please. We have four minutes until the piccata. I think we might have lost you there for a second. Chef, can you hear us? Oh, cutting something. Adam, watch me through the local from a farm. Like, probably about three. From up top, I am. One straight motion. You never want to be sawing. That is when you get cut. That's never good. And look how gorgeous this tomato is. You we did so have a pretty. question about that one in the beginning. Is it a specific type of tomato? Um, not really. I mean, it's an heirloom, but it's, uh, this one in general is just gorgeous. I mean, sometimes you look out. I actually had one that looked like a heart the other day. It was so cute. Um, so it's really just, I mean, when things are growing in a farm, they don't look perfect for a reason. They're just part of nature and, you know, they're just beautiful. I mean, this is just very, and they taste great. You know, they, they just taste great. I'll put a little sea salt, maybe make it caprese with it. Um, and the cantaloupe will be my dessert. So basically I have a three course dinner in uh, you know, a half hour or so. Um, obviously at home, I never think people should rush. I think that you, once you do it two or three or four times, then feel free to pick up the pace but don't rush it, especially when you're cutting things. You don't need to cut a finger off. Um, I have, it's not fun. Chef, while that's finishing cooking, we do have a ton of questions rolling in, so we'll do our best to get to as, mu as many as we can. Um, yeah, don't one, worry. One question worry. is, uh, what type of pans do you saute with? Another good question. 
Another very good question. So, um, I like to, so in, in cooking school, we used all clad pans, um, but all clad pans are, are not the easiest to use. You have to have your pan very hot. Um, and then you also have to add your oil and then you sear. I know a lot of people are eating healthier. There's so many non-stick pans out there. They all work fine. I mean, truthfully, everyone has their own preference. Like Le Gousses are the old school, super heavy, but they'll last you 500 years. Um, you know, at home, you don't really want a heavy pan. So I would say a saute pan, it's all about the look of the pan in terms of size, in terms of width. You gotta stop moving because it probably shakes. You get, uh, so if I'm doing two or three pieces of chicken, it's all about my width of the pan. This is not a great pan, but it'll work fine because it's wide enough. I'm not overcrowding my pan. So that's what I would say. Use a large enough pan. Don't be putting your chicken on top of chicken. And if you want to get a sear, your pan has to be hot. All clads are great. They're one of my favorites, but they're super pricey. You do not need an amazing pan. Um, watch out for the nonstick pans with the coatings that come off. Not good. Next. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another question, what inspired you to become a chef? And how old were you when you started cooking? Um, so I've cooked my whole life. Not well. I was not a good cook. Um, but I loved it. So I went to cooking school 12 years ago. I said that, but before that, I remember when I was like 12, 10 years old, maybe, I was trying to flip eggs and I got them all over my mom's floor, but my mom was still super supportive and she took me to food and wine and I went to cooking school two weeks after. That was after I was fundraising for a university. So it's sort of that's the story of how I became a chef. I've always liked to cook and that is when I pursued cooking as a profession. Next. Did you, um, can you think of the biggest challenge you had maybe while you were in cooking school or something that, you know, you overcame to become the chef you are today? Uh, I overcome stuff every day to become a chef I am today. I think that now I'm on, you know, I've been running my own business probably about five years now fully uh, without working really much in restaurants unless I'm consulting. So I think every day it's new challenges, time management. Um, patience and just knowing that things are going to happen that are out of your control. Traffic happens. Sometimes you get to clients 20 minutes before a dinner is supposed to happen for a seven course dinner. And when you have a lot of those experiences and you get through your, I would call it temper tantrum phase, which is when you get overly stressed out, nothing's going to happen if, you know, you're losing it except for a messy kitchen, uh, bad food. And a lot of times you cook from the heart. So, if you're not cooking from the heart, it means you don't want to cook and it means your food's probably not going to be at the standard that it could be if you really want to be doing it. So maybe get out of the kitchen and let your partner do it. All right, next. Um, do you have a favorite restaurant to eat at? Uh, you know what? I have a lot of favorite restaurants to eat at. Like you saw, I have a lot of favorite restaurants to eat at. Um, in New York, I would say my favorite pizza because we're talking about pizza, San Mateo, it's off the hook. Um, I love, in general, tapas because I can try a bunch of things. Once in a while, like once a year, I'll take my wife to like a two-star Michelin restaurant, spend way too much money, and I will love it. But um, I go there because I want to see how food's presented. I want to get that type of service. But in general, I'm just happy to eat out. I'm always cooking, so I really don't care. I'm pretty flexible, but I, I'm a big stickler when it comes to bad service. You know, if I'm spending money, if I'm getting some nice wine, some good food, I just want to have a good experience. For me, it's all about the experience. Next. Awesome. This one's a really fun question. Um, yeah. If you could eat one meal on a deserted island that magically appears, what would it be? How would it magically appear? <laughs> that I don't know. <laughs> all right, cool. Um, I would say uh, – the longest aged prime ribeye cooked medium rare with a nice crust on the outside, super sexy. Bernays sauce, maybe a few sides, and then a pizza too. <laughs> no, I'm just a kidding. Pizza, a pizza, pizza for now. dessert? Yeah, yeah. That, oh, dessert pizza is great. Nutella, banana, strawberries, boom. Mm. Just like a crepe, but on crack, it's better. Pizza, 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 dessert pizza is a real thing in New York, by the way. It's real. It's real. Awesome. Um, I know you've done some international traveling. Do you have a favorite cuisine um, that you have either eaten or learned to cook while traveling? 
Um, I would say we'll talk about that in a second, but one of my most interesting culinary travels was Vietnam. Um, I was in Vietnam and Cambodia, and the food in Vietnam was phenomenal. And I would just, this is when I was on the Food Network, I would just walk in kitchens and start cooking with people who didn't understand what I was saying. They didn't understand what I was saying. And it was just great. That was the most fun experience. Um, I would say France probably has some of the best food. Italy's food's good, but I've been to very touristy places, I think. Um, I still want to go on a full culinary tour, so I'll get back to you on that. I want to go to the countryside and just see really what the grandmas and grandpas and people from the towns are cooking. So right now, I would say I'm always inspired. It's not really a country, because I can be inspired in this country or another, but it's really just the products around the food and the chefs and the passion around the chef. Awesome, thank you. After you complete all your travels, we'll love to hear your report. Great. Um, another um, question we had um, was, if you're hosting a dinner party, you know whether they're cooking this chicken piccata that you've taught us, um, what is an easy or like what is your go-to appetizer? Oh, I don't know. That's a, that's a tough one. Uh, truthfully, because I make it, it's hard for me to give you these answers because I make so many things that uh, I don't know. I would say right now, just to, like if I was going to put together an appetizer right now just looking at my melon and, and I'm just thinking mozzarella right here. Like my head's already going in like burrata world uh, just because I see tomatoes and cantaloupe. So I would say caprese is an easy one. You know, get some nice burrata, some nice tomatoes are in season right now, a little bit of chiffonade basil, touch of mint, you have a nice refreshing little olive oil, a little lemon, boom. That's it, nice and easy. You certainly make it easy. Really easy, yes. <laughs> Simplicity is um, good sometimes. Absolutely. Uh, to kind of shift for just one second away from cooking, if you aren't cooking, uh, what are some of your favorite things to do? Paddleboarding is my new favorite activity. I will say that. That I can 100% say. I've been paddleboarding a lot, and it is a great core workout and super fun. Uh, but basically anything on the beach, anything outside. I like biking, um, fishing. I love fishing. Um, you know, and that's probably my favorite things to do at the moment, whenever I'm off work. Awesome. Do we need to check on that chicken? I know you warned us about burning it. Oh, I just looked at it. I got a sneak peek. But yes, we can not only look at it, we can check it out. Boom. Oh, yeah, baby. Let me get in here. Let me get in here. All right. Let's get. Oh, yes. All right. So now we have our little bit of deliciousness. Oh yeah. And you saw I only used a little touch of butter, but it's sexy. Oh, those tomatoes are calling my name. Adam, where'd you go? You run away already? My film, my film guy, my 10 year old uh, nephew just ran away from me. Um, all right, so the chicken, as you can see, it was seared properly. How do you know when chicken is done? You can put your fingers through it. Um, no, that's a true thing. Um, the texture should not be flimsy. It should be firm. It should go right through, and it is looking pretty. What I will do? Oh, the sauce is actually on point. So I always want to here. I always want to try the sauce um, and make sure it's balanced right because that's the sauce I might put on. You know, I might even make another dish, with a fish dish. Use that same sauce for it. Pasta, toss in the same sauce. You know, it, it's yummy, it's acidic, I taste the lemon, I taste the saltiness from the capers, and I'm pretty pleased with it, actually. And I made it all while talking to you all in this amount of time, and you guys can do it. This is a dish you can absolutely do, even if as a beginner, within an hour, while drinking a glass of wine if you're of age, and having a good time, listening to some music. Well, we can't thank you enough, Chef. And um, if you have any last things you want to share, we're all ears. If not, we can turn it over to Zach. Make sure to keep supporting the Jimmy Fund. Great organization. And any questions, email them. And I will always be here for you. Chef Chris, signing off. Everybody, you've been great. Thank you. Thanks, Chef.
Thank you, Chef. Sorry, that was uh, that was very exciting. Um, I didn't know uh, watching cooking. Um, admittedly, not something I do all the time. Um, well, that was great. That was awesome. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, whether or not you were were cooking along with Chef Chris or um, just kind of watching and, and gathering information and getting some questions answered, um, remind you that of course it will be the uh, the session has been recorded. And will be sent out tomorrow so you can you know continue to perfect it um, so i do want to thank uh chef chris for joining us i also want to send another special thank you to both sbli and stop and shop um, our generous sponsors for this evening for all that you do and your dedication to the jimmy fund and the jimmy fund walk um, you know again i've said this at the beginning uh, there's really no group of people more passionate about the walk community and about the walk than our pace setters i cannot begin to thank you enough for all that you do. Um, I know that you'll continue to rise to the challenge this year. It's, you know, it's certainly a challenging year. It's certainly unprecedented. Um, and walk day will look a little different. Um, but knowing that you all are kind of the leaders of the pack within our group, uh, I just cannot thank you enough. Um, our staff is here to help you as much as we can. We're here to support you for the uh, 45 days leading up to walk day. And then, uh, of course, certainly after the walk as well. So whether it's to simply check in on fundraising, to talk, just to simply say hello, or any sort of mix of the, of the two, please don't hesitate to reach out, um, send us an email, set up a time to chat on a Zoom, um, video conference, anything. Uh, we are here to support you as much as we can. Um, we really would like uh, feedback on, on tonight's event. So along with the, uh, with the recording tomorrow that you get via email, there'll be a survey on tonight's event. Love to hear from you on that. You know, as we've shifted over the last few months and as we will you know undoubtedly continue to shift into these virtual gatherings versus being able to get together in person uh, we want to continue to either give you know new good content we want to be able to build on the events that we've given you in the past and we can't do that unless we know kind of how we're doing so please some uh, uh, some constructive feedback whether positive or negative we definitely want to hear um, and, and you know as we look forward to uh, events down the road that we can that we can bring to you in a virtual setting. So um, having said that, again, I just want to thank everybody. I think we're a couple minutes shy of 630. So we're going to give you a couple of minutes back. Thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you for continuing to support the walk. Thank you for continuing uh, your support of the Jimmy Fund. Uh, and we wish everybody a really healthy night, a healthy weekend. Um, stay socially distant. Stay uh, stay safe out there, and we look forward to talking to you soon. Um, we have our next town hall on Tuesday, August 25th at 9 a.m. would encourage you, if you have yet to register for that, to hop on there. Um, we have a really great uh, patient speaker, uh, as well as the Dana-Farber staff as well that will be joining us. So we look forward to seeing you all, um, hopefully on Tuesday, and seeing everybody, of course, on walk day on Sunday, October 4th. So I uh, wish you all a very good night and we will talk to you soon. Take care.